Please join me in welcoming Ali Gaisari, who studied at Tehran University and Oxford, and later taught at the University of San Diego. He has published extensively in, on, on the intellectual history of, and politics of modern Iran. His, uh, his more recent publications include Fruits of Gardens, Ethics, Metaphysics, and Textual Pleasures in Late Qajar Iran, and an equal treatise and the question of sovereignty in Qajar and early Pahlavi Iran. Ali served as the editor-in-chief of Iranian Studies until 2020, and his current research is on aspects of legal and constitutional history of modern Iran, and we'll speak about the idea of commerce and its configurations in Qajar Iran, domestic and transregional context. I'm very grateful uh, for the invitation and the organizers of the, uh, the symposium. And then last summer, uh, Professor Melville and I talked about uh, my potential contribution to the symposium, and uh, I talked about something about commerce. Uh, I told Charles that uh, you know, economic history is a little bit beyond me. But since the focal point of the symposium is on the idea of Iran, I will do my best to say something about the idea of commerce. Um, and uh, uh, its configurations or gestalts, so to speak, in the late Qajar period. Um, at the outset, perhaps we should note that a good deal of commerce in Qajar Iran was carried out through several transregional routes of exchange and communication through which uh, not only goods and capital, but also ideas traveled. Uh, uh, as we see on this map, and you can, uh, you know, at the risk of uh, some oversimplification, you can you know, distinguish the typology of the ideas from the uh, new British India circuit to the Caucasus, more radical to the more uh, romantic nationalism, so to speak, from the Ottoman circuit, and the uh, you know Indian, of course, being much more into the British and Scottish political economy. Uh, 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 constellations of concepts and values, you know, even in the creative literature, um, uh, the necessity of improving port authorities, railway, 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 always uh, comes out of India. And uh, uh, by the same token, you can run a typology of more radical and, uh, uh, in a sense, anarchist, in a kind of political philosophy sense of the term. Uh, from the Caucasus and so forth. Um, uh, domestically, however, commercial life was usually impacted uh, by the interactions between the state uh, with greater or lesser presence and the merchants also with greater or lesser presence. Uh, uh, this map uh, uh, it was recently posted by Bernard Rucard, which shows uh, 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 north central routes uh, of the caravans uh, taking from uh, uh, Tehran in regions into, into the Caspian. I'll go back to this uh, just for the sake of the conversation. Um, by drawing on a broad range of primary and secondary material, this presentation and ultimately the finished paper will explore the domestic Qajar commerce within uh, two distinct uh, uh, but interrelated uh, domains of meaning and practice. Uh, in terms of the ideational and the real or material factors in social life and transactions. Uh, in Qajar period, the state in many ways had a nominal uh, nevertheless normative presence whose materiality projected itself in greater or lesser extent on the maintenance of order within its often fluid domain, uh, attempting to collect taxes as much as it could, and administering justice which itself was subject to social and local variables and often lacked uniformity. While the merchants who did their best to navigate this milieu by utilizing possibilities of supply and demand 
and surviving economic, political, and environmental, including public health, uh, rough currents and periodic uh, hardships that were often beyond their control. Uh, speaking of sources, especially in regarding matters of private transactions, uh, in good measure we need to rely on private papers. Uh, as I have uh, argued elsewhere, uh, in the 19th century, the Qajar state developed uh, a broad range of dealings with several contemporary states, such as Ottoman, Russian, British, and the French, uh, that had complex structures. By comparison, however, to the extent that we see elsewhere, uh, Iran did not have a centralized uh, archive that could be utilized in, you know, in later research. For instance, in a hypothetical uh, working day of the week uh, during the Qajar period, it was not the minister who would go to the ministry, but the ministry that would go to the home slash office of the minister. Uh, it was within the minister's personal and private space that most of the meetings and the bulk of the paperwork of his ministry were handled. Uh, also, often such uh, documents and material would, would either uh, remain within ministerial families as routinely el uh, uh, elder sons or other close relatives would be next in line uh, for the same office. Or if the principal office holder fell from grace, uh, then some, although not all, uh, of the papers would be transported to the home slash office of the uh, new office holder and so on. Um, uh, an exception, of course, here was perhaps the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, that first during the short-lived uh, period of Amir Kabir uh, kept copies of foreign treaties and correspondence, the so-called Sabah de Mokatabat, uh, and then in the more organized uh, way some years later, uh, during the time of Sepah Sarar, Mizal Seng, of course that such material were kept uh, uh, in an annex within the Golestan Palace. Uh, in a broader context, therefore, uh, different types of official as well as private material were often being held uh, within private households and among you know, other sorts of private papers, uh, ranging from letters, property deeds, affidavits, inheritance probates, accounting ledgers, receipts, and such like. Further changes in the political and career fortunes of old ministerial and relating to our topic, commercial families in the course of the 20th century and the inevitable generational turns and downsizing their residences so to the further sort of dispersal and disappearance of such material. But seen together and to the extent that some of them have survived and gradually being uh, recovered, edited, and published, they are indeed significant for the historiography of the Hajar period. Uh, with further uh, regard to sources, especially uh, when it concerns merchants and their commercial activities, we have, uh, uh, so we have another challenge that is in fact, uh, and it's the fact that by and large, merchants were conservative and were seldom keen on writing down their memoirs. Uh, exceptional cases, of course, always existed, uh, such as the ones I'm going to talk about a little bit. An additional fact uh, that also contributed to this was that usually merchants were quite busy uh, uh, with their routine daily work, unless there was a force majeure. Uh, uh, the Russian occupation, the cholera, and, and so forth, that they had kind of a good chunk of hand, uh, time on their hands, and so forth. Uh, uh, which fully, I mean, that, you know, them being busy, it fully consumed their, their time. Reading through merchants' uh, primary material and beyond specific business and monetary details of the transactions, Certain patterns can be, can be discerned, which in essence have economic basis and are manifested in, uh, in both mental and material, or in other words, ideational and real factors. Uh, for instance, during uncertain times, merchants were often reluctant 
to hang on to cash uh, for far too long. Uh, an exchange value of cash would be melting uh, before their eyes. So on these occasions, the cash was no longer king. Uh, and in later years, uh, uh, those who held on to their liquid assets in, for example, Russian imperial rubles, uh, uh, as it was a trend in at least the northern parts of Iran, Rash and Zeli and so forth, uh, lived to uh, uh, regret it bitterly. Uh, when such notes uh, lost their value almost overnight following the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, for example, one of those uh, sort of mentioned memoirs that I was referring to, and I published uh, uh, parts of it uh, uh, it's earlier, and today I'm going to you know, touch on some of the points, but move on to another set of uh, documentary material within the same cluster of uh, merchants from Tabriz, Istanbul, and uh, I will see. Uh, in, for example, in Tabriz, sort of in the Tabriz-based Jurabchi merchant memoirs that I published some years ago, we come across occasions that around the period 1905-1911, uh, junior brothers uh, were often sent to the bazaar with the assignment uh, to buy whatever they could get you know, their hands on. And there were five brothers and sisters, same parents. Uh, with the usual instructions that uh, the good is not perishable, is portable and relatively easy to store and keeps the prospect of it being always on demand. Hence, in such circumstances, we see that they go beyond their specific line of trade and deal in such items as yarn, rope, tobacco, which in turn could have long-term impact on their commercial portfolio. Initially starting with socks, but then they go to tobacco, rope, and so on. Which in this uh, uh, case, for example, one of the brothers branched out from Tabriz to Rasht, where around 1905 he sets up a tobacco uh, processing plant and warehouse, although such moves often involved uh, uh, their own challenges. As local merchants are not always welcoming uh, to newcomers setting up shop on the turf. Uh, also, such moves uh, by merchants could occasionally involve um, broader transregional implications that made their uh, uh, commerce more spread out uh, without much prior planning or intent. And in such diversifications, almost always different life scenarios intertwined. For instance, in 1905, and again in 1908, further to the revolutionary upheavals in Tabriz, uh, the Jurabchi brothers branched out to Rasht, and not all of them, uh, 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 the middle uh, uh, brothers. Uh, uh, where, as, they, as we saw, uh, beside their main line of business dealing in socks, they also traded in other things such as tobacco. At the same time, Rash, the nearby Caspian port of Anzali, experienced an influx of a sizable uh, and diverse community of emigres from Russia, including uh, you know, Armenians uh, and some Russian revolutionaries, of course, uh, as a result of the 1905 revolutions in, in Russia. In 1909, Fajmoa Matavi, uh, the eldest brother, joins his younger brother, Haj Reza, in Rasht. In fact, Haj Reza had already been going to Rasht on business since 1899. There, at one, uh, at one point, uh, they bought 6,000 tumans, a sizable sum at that time, in worth of barot, or trade bills, from, uh, so in French francs, from an Armenian resident of Rasht, for less than their face value. The bills uh, had been issued by a bank in Paris. The brothers sent the bills uh, to Istanbul for collection on maturation date. But soon they were informed by their associates in Istanbul that the bank was defunct and the bills were bounced. Hajj Reza waited another uh, four anxious months, then in January 1910 went to Istanbul hoping in vain to cash the bills. The brothers lost 
in that investment, and as well as an additional 1,002 months that they spent to collect it. In the meanwhile, Hajraza in Istanbul uh, counts the losses and buys an office and begins to run a profitable business. Uh, apparently, in two years, they recovered all the losses. But Reza stays uh, on in Istanbul while keeping his ties uh, with Tabriz as well, uh, at times traveling back and forth. Perhaps it is likely that the brothers and their father, uh, uh, at least till, you know, till the father was alive, Hajraza Hassan, uh, you saw him in an earlier uh, slide, were operating under a regime of counting their assets as one, uh, the so-called Jam ul Mal uh, arrangement, which was an old practice in mer mer merchant families, something that deserves to be studied more attentively. Uh, I haven't come across any uh, survey on this uh, uh, kind of hotlock uh, joint ownership. Uh, uh, of course, there was a pecking order, but uh, it was uh, uh, everybody at the share. Uh, on this latter note, and very briefly, uh, we can argue that, in fact, such practice uh, was one of the recurrent uh, patterns of asset formation that, to a certain extent, continued into the 20th century. Uh, but be that as it may, and by the same token, on some occasions, this also was responsible for asset disintegration. Uh, in particular during disputes over inheritance. Moreover, and quite independent of this last point, the Islamic rules of inheritance alone could play a key role in asset dissolution, uh, in pretty much like a torpedo. Uh, the Jurabchis uh, of Tabriz, this shows in fact uh, uh, younger generations and some of the uh, new middle brothers, in the paternal uh, house of Hassan in, uh, in Tabriz, uh, and uh, the younger clergyman sitting in front is no less than Ali Sheikh uh, al Islam, Sirat uh, al uh, Islam, I'm sorry, shortly before uh, he was executed by the Russians following the 1911 occupation of Tabriz. He was uh, uh, one of the militant leaders against the Russians. So and the affiliation of this the cluster of brothers with uh, you know, the locks of Sheikh al-Islam also signals uh, their political lineage as well. Uh, Reza, who had already learned some Russian in, in Rasht, they also picked up French in Istanbul. And besides business, uh, participated in various Iranian activities in Istanbul, such as getting involved in the constitutionalist and Jumali Saadat, as well as the Iranian Grammar School, and was closely acquainted with the Iranian you know, merchant community, and also a diverse group of Iranian literati in Istanbul, uh, including Tabi Zadeh, uh, whom we heard uh, earlier, Hussein Donesh, Kazem Zadeh Irashar, and Pudawud, among others. Some of them, of course, he must have known from Tabriz. Uh, Hajj uh, in Istanbul uh, spreads activities. These were two of the indications from the uh, uh, Iranian society in Istanbul. And uh, 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 the grammar school. And uh, uh, among the merchants, that he met and subsequently formed uh, close family ties with, and that would be the next focus of the case study, we can single out the story of the Hajj Meza Fatalia Esfahani, which vividly demonstrates the confluence of several uh, uh, trajectories of life, commerce, and politics. I'm a German historian, but um... I have become an Iranian historian through my work in an archive that has powered my research over the last decade. Um, I've been working in a collection on Iranian history that is not well known, that should be much better known. I've come to the realization that one of the largest sets of documents 
on Iran's modern history is an archive located at the German Foreign Office in Berlin. This archive is both huge and forgotten. And the questions of why it is so big is something I will talk about today. Why it's forgotten is a whole other set of questions, but I'd be happy to talk about that in the discussion. Now, I discovered it a number of years ago. Uh, I was actually working on Ernst, Ernst Herzfeld, and I went into the archive to kind of just do some exploratory work about German-Iranian relations. And I got started with the usual indexes, which had pages and pages of listings. So I started ordering these documents and reading them. And I read the old German script, and diplomatic documents are covered with handwriting. So if you can read the handwriting, they show you, they keep leading you to more, more and more documents, more and more collections, including um, an entire, uh, basically I came upon the, the old working archive of the German ministry in Tehran, between 1923 and 1941, which is behind a kind of archival wall of silence because there is no index for it. You have to, I found it going through the handwritten, um, the handwritten notes on the other documents and got a, an old mimeographed list of the contents of 73 very large boxes, which as I was working with them, I, I then realized what I was looking at. And it was essentially as if they had been lifted out of file cabinets and placed into these heavy boxes and then wrapped around with ropes and paper. and So unwrapping them, uh, especially the ones that probably had not been unpacked since 1941, was, was pretty interesting. So to assess the scope and size of this archive, kind of uh, earlier on, a number of years ago, I worked with an archivist, and together we compiled a master list of the collections on Iran that are at, at the Foreign Office and in the Federal Archives. And this is just a list of like the different topics with like 10 cartons, 20 files, you know, a list. The list itself is 85 single space pages long. So it's absolutely enormous. It gets bigger as you go into the 20th century and it covers a huge number of topics. So in a talk last year, I introduced this archive and reflected on how Iran's modern history can be rethought in the light of these documents. As the documents cover a multitude of topics, I mean, the, the archive was really created by very confident and expanding German foreign office in the late 19th century that was eager to promote the expansion of its trade and to secure Germany's position in the developing world economy. So it always sees Iran as a piece of a much larger puzzle. And these documents really speak about uh, the, the globalizing world, especially in terms of the world economy and the place of Germany and Iran in it. And a lot of the documents are future-oriented. They're about possible projects, what could be if Germany and Iran work together. So just some examples of, of some of these documents. We, this was introduced today. Uh, this is the Otto Blau trade mission. There are lots of what I call trade topographies that German officials write on Iran, incredibly, in, in, uh, incredibly detailed assessments. They were meant to be comprehensive accounts of the state of Iran's economy at different times. But they go into all the local areas. They assess all the local products, the merchant practices, the money changing, the roads that go in, etc. And so this, is, um, this one's been published but uh, this is actually the Nachlass, as it says here. These are his private papers. Otto Blau was a Prussian trade official, and this is the first modern uh, German-Prussian trade mission to Iran, so this is an example. They talk about infrastructure projects. So I'll just run through some of this quickly. I can come back to it later, though, if people are interested. All kinds of infrastructure product projects. Uh, reports on Iran's situation during the Balkan Wars which is incredibly interesting to read in, in together with the history of the Constitutional Revolution, because the Russians saw Iran and the Balkans as two arms of Russian power coming down and surrounding uh, the Ottomans. Um, so when the Russians move forward in the Balkans, they move back in Iran, and it creates opportunities for the constitutionalist armies, for example. You can really see this back and forth of Russian power across the region through these, through these documents. Um, all kinds of stuff about all sorts of Anglo-Russian tensions. This is uh, about the Anglo-Persian Oil Company in 1914 with this very striking map. 
of what Persia might have looked like uh, had the First World War not, not that there are all kinds of different mappings that they're doing. So the Russians and British are really kind of horse trading at this point in 1914 about who gets what in Iran. Uh, military and intelligence missions in World War I. The most famous for Iranian history is, of course, the Kaveh group, which was called in the German documents the Persian Independence Committee. They called themselves a constitutionalist government in exile, which will be very important for what I'm going to talk about. Here's Takizadeh. Oh, you can't see my, can't see the arrow over here on the side. Here in Hussein Kuli Khan, there is, well, Wahid al Mulk. Um, they worked for German military intelligence and were part of what uh, the Foreign Office called the Revolution Program. Um, things on do all kinds of documents on refugees in Iran, these were uh, what are called Russian Germans coming out of the Caucasus and into Iran after 1928. Regional wartime surveillance, etc. There are all any number of topics, uh, there's a lot of information. So, what these documents show um, really is that Germany is an active factor, is an active presence in Iran. Uh, is Germany is not, um, not a side issue, not an absence, and not an afterthought, even though these documents are almost never brought into the modern history of Iran. I'm, I'm making an argument, as you see, that they should be. They also show very clearly the contours of Russian and, and British power in the country. They show these in a much sharper outline, and you see kind of what the Russians and British do, why they do what they do, and when they do it, when you factor in the German presence. And I'll give an example of that um, a little bit later on in the talk. Well, I've come to see that this, and I thought this this morning when I was listening to uh, William, uh, uh, is it William? Yes. We share a last name, which is interesting. William, <laughs> William Jenkins' uh, interesting paper that the, the German documents provide a kind of connective tissue to all sorts of other topics. And they're incredibly detailed because the, Germans, the, German, the German documents differ from the Russian and the British official documents in very strong and profound ways. The Germans had a very different idea of Iran, to put it that way. Um, they are not Orientalist. And I'll give some examples of that in, in later on in the talk. They were very much this, these, these official, so this archive about Iran is about commerce. It's not about culture, and it's about trade and the promotion of trade. And the Germans, the, the diplomats report extensively on what are called local conditions. And you see that in the trade topographies. They go from place to place to place and just report on things in great detail, which gives a wealth of information about Iran, for example, in 1907-1908. Um, this is the type of information that, uh, where my paper would in intersect with, with Williams, is that the, the data, essentially the, the information that Mohammed Jamal Zadeh uses to write Ganji Shaigan, and which he publishes in Berlin in 1917, as he is a member of this group, and they have a press, the German Foreign Office gave the Indian Independence Committee and the Persian Independence Committee a shared press, which is what publishes Ganji Shaigan. He's drawing from a five volume, really enormous trade report um, of the state of Iran's economy in 1907-1908. So the data that he's using is coming from one of these German sources, which was right there in Berlin where he was writing, writing his account. Um, these, do uh, these documents are also, as I said before, very future-oriented, which is important. Okay, so British and Russian commentators often uh, commented on Iran's oriental despotism. Uh, Germans do not do this. They have a very different perspective, a different um, look at the country. And in fact, the archive shows mainly how these German officials are viewing Iran as a site of geostrategic opportunity. They say that Iran had been a site of world trade in the past, and perhaps with us together it will be so again. So they see their own interests furthered, uh, furthered in this way. The diplomats' future-oriented perspective recommends them to Iranian nationalists and constitutionalists 
many of who welcomed Germany as a possible European partner for industrial development. And these nationalists hoped that Germany would provide needed protection against the predatory politics of both Great Britain and, and Russia, and that Germany could modernize their country with machinery, with money, and with modern science. That's the hope. And the constitutional movement in Iran really attempts to put these beliefs into practice. So in the remainder of the talk, I want to speak about uh, this relationship. What I see is really the root of the modern relationship between Germany and Iran, which comes from the constitutional revolution and the connections that these diplomats forge with the constitutional movement and with, with a number of its leaders. And then I, this is one of the central uh, stories that the archive tells. It's a story that the archive has allowed me to bring together. And then I want to talk about two of its after effects. So how that relationship then plays forward. One being the shape and the timing of the Anglo-Russian Convention of 1907. And the second being this, this uh, assessment of the Iranian economy, this trade report about Iran in 1907-08, uh, the data, sort of the gathering of the data that was Jamal Zadeh later used in Ganji Shagan. Um, it was gathered by a young uh, trade official named Kurt Jung, and his name actually means young. Yeah, Jung means young, but he is young. That's also why there are no uh, pictures of him. And, and I'll give a taste of like the the type of report, the type of perspective on Iran's economy that he gives, that Mohammed Jamal Zadeh found so useful in undergirding his arguments about economic sovereignty. So economic sovereignty is really central to national sovereignty in Iran. Okay, so uh, without further ado, uh, to the Constitutional Revolution. So a primary cause of the Constitutional Revolution was the bankruptcy of the Qajar state, as this had been aided and abetted by British and Russian officials. Starting in 1888, these officials had used their political influence over the Shah, the court, and the ministers to gather very valuable economic con concessions. These targeted the lucrative extraction of natural resources, so mineral rights, agricultural products, Caspian fish and caviar, just to give a few examples, they were about control over roads and railways. They were contracts for the building of infrastructure and the securing of customs revenues. So this whole issue of the concessions is very important for the, for the Germans and also for the constitutionalists. And by 1905-06, as the Qajar court is staggering under the burden of foreign loans and interest payments, a protest led by merchants and clerics kicked off this popular movement for reform. All of you, all of you know this. What's interesting, though, and where the Germans come in, is that in its opening event, the protesters are calling for rights and freedoms, a free press, equality before the, of the, the excuse me, equality before the law, the institution of a parliament that would check the power of the Shah. They're calling for a written constitution. They're also calling for a bank, a national bank, to counter the imperial banks of the British and the Russians. And this is the precise point where Germany comes in. Now, German newspapers were reporting on the Constitutional Revolution, and by 1906, prominent constitutionalists were approaching Germany's officials in Tehran with offers to partner in the state's modernization. It was hoped that these officials, like this man here, Wilhelm Stemmerich, who was the German minister in Tehran, it was, they were seen, Stemmerich was seen as a spokesman for Germany's industrial power and institutional expertise, and it was hoped that Germany would aid in Iran's transformation into a modern administrative state, would help it create a modern treasury, a national bank, a tax code, a lot of the things that the Schuster mission later on is, is charged with doing, the desires that the Majlis wants Schuster to fulfill, a lot of these are initially made as requests to the Germans. Now the German, uh, importantly, these German diplomats, perhaps because they're nationalists themselves in, in a lot of ways, they're very proud of Germany's recent, recent uh, achievement of a nation state, and they're sort of enthusiastic nationalists. Uh, very importantly, they support the nationalist movement and its sovereignty claims. And the British and the Russians do not do this. So this is a, a very important difference. The German minister here, Wilhelm Stemmerich, he was also very clear about where Berlin stands in the conflict. 
The new parliament needs funds. Germany wants a closer relationship with the parliament. Because Germany is only allowed to be economically involved in Iran, it can't really be involved with the Shah in the court in the same way as the Russians and the British, so it wants to be involved with the parliament. So the German officials recognize the Majlis, they recognize its attempt to create new financial institutions, and they support the nationalist call for economic sovereignty regarding state debt and the ownership of natural resources. They work with them and they decide they are going to work with them. There's a joint project going forward and a bank concession to establish a new national bank, which would be a state bank for Iran and a trade bank for Germany. And I, I'm assuming that people know this, but the Imperial Bank of Persia has the right to print, print paper money in Iran. Not that, so the, the, this was something that was said to the Germans. They want control over their own money, which they don't have. It's the Imperial Bank which prints, which prints the money. So for members of the Majlis, national sovereignty is articulated as being connected to economic sovereignty for the ones who are coming together with, with the Germans. And per the 1906 constitution, it's the parliament rather than the Shah that is going to exercise authority over all, quote, foreign loans, contracts, and concessions, end of quote. So representatives of the first parliament of October 1906, they believe that the foreign debt that's been brokered for the Shah by, via the Russian and British imperial banks, th that this is a terrible danger facing the new state. They drew lessons from the fates of their neighbors from Egypt and the Ottoman Empire and their European controlled debt commissions. And they could see a kind of debt commission which is being threatened, kind of coming at them potentially as well. Egypt and the Ottoman Empire had become, as it was said, mortgaged states. They were sovereign in name only. They did not have real freedom or independence given that they were dictated to and constrained by the debt commissions. So this is what they, uh, the members of the Majlis, like Sani Odaule, who um, is, works very closely together with Stemrick, and the friendship between the two of them, or the seeming friendship, it said Sani Odaule is going in and out of the German embassy, <laughs> the, um, or not the German legation, it's a legation, not an embassy. So uh, they're, the fact that they're going in and out is, is remarked on. So the, these parliamentarians feared being subjected to such a debt commission, and in February 1907, they set out a list of demands to clean the proverbial financial household. The quote, prevention of any fresh loans from Russia or England, end of quote, was at the top of this list, followed by others. For example, that foreigners that were imposed controlling customs revenue, specifically the Belgian officials who currently held these posts, they should be removed, they should re be replaced by administrators responsible to parliament, and that a new national bank be established. So this bank concession was the key to the situation as finances for the government, as well as the administration of what was now being called national revenue rather than the Shah's purse, as well as the highly politicized issue of the terms on which the government would negotiate its lending. This was huge. This sounds like now, but this was very active back then. The terms on which the government could negotiate its lending these were primary concerns, and resolving Iran's financial questions became really central to the political struggle. And success, it's not an, under, it's not an overstatement to say that success or failure in this area, the money, the resources that the Majlis had available, could determine the course of the revolution. Now the Germans, for their part, they see the benefit of negotiating with this new set of partners, with the Majlis. They could co collaborate, uh, directly with the Persian nationalist politicians and businessmen, thus gaining a kind of strategic edge. They now have their partner in the country. So in furthering the project of financial administrative reform, Stemmerich solidifies his relationships with these leading parliamentarians, the Majlis president, Sani Abdullah, his brother, Mukbara Saltane, the minister of education for the first parliament, and Istaham es Saltaneh, the Majlis president in the fall of 1907. And the first two are members of the prominent Hedayat family, and they had studied in Germany. Sani Adala, in fact, had studied mineralogy 
and was an industrialist himself with plans for railroads, for sugar processing plants, and for textiles. And so his interest in forging a kind of modern state structure and legal system for Iran in order to industrialize the country, these interests align very closely with Stemmerich's own. And in fact, uh, it was reported when he is assassinated in February 1911 by, as it was, it was said, two Georgian assassins who gunned him down. Uh, he was the finance minister in the winter of 1911 and had just negotiated a potential German loan and her, had arranged uh, Morgan Schuster's contract. And uh, the German minister uh, then writes to the chancellor that the Russian paper, the Novio Vremia, uh, quote, spread the news of the German friendly stance of the murdered man, as it was said. So his connections with Stemmerich proved to be very dangerous for Saudi Adalo. So actions taken by German officials and Iranian nationalists around economic sovereignty are practical, they're financial, they're institutional, but I want to emphasize that sovereignty here also has an emotional side. It refers to the importance of mutual recognition and self-respect between partners. In contrast to Germany, British and Russian diplomats do not recognize the claims of what they call Muslim nations, including Iran. And Russian and British officials routinely denigrate Persian politics as either ridiculous, it's not politics at all, it's just chaos, or dangerous, it's anarchy. It's not, the Germans by contrast see it as rational and see it as political and valorize the, the movement in these terms. And that, that makes a huge difference here. German officials speak of a political movement with legitimate, with legitimate claims. Now discussions between British and German diplomats in Tehran raise the issue of the sovereignty claims of the Iranian nationalist movement and their appeals to dignity, respect, and a common humanity. And several British diplomats see Whitehall's rejection of the nationalist movement as a dangerous flaw in British imperial diplomacy, as they realize that the moral claims underpinning their diplomacy would be shown to be hollow. So in this case, um, this man here, Cecil Spring Rice, very well known, he was the minister, young minister in Tehran at this point. He worries, his letters are really interesting on this point, so I wanna speak a little bit about that. The di this diplomat, Cecil Spring Rice, worries that Britain's position, the position that Britain is taking vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the Persian constitutional revolution is offering hostages to, to fortune. Specifically, he says, the contempt shown by British officials, either directly or indirectly, to the new political forces emerging in Iran is a matter of concern. As he writes to his friend, who is the editor, he's in the middle here, editor of the London Times, Valentin Chiro, Britain's lack of real support for the constitutionalists, for their nationalism, and for their parliamentary aspirations, that this was experienced in Iran as, at the very least, hypocrisy, or something uh, decidedly worse. It was certainly met with incomprehension. And Kazam Zadeh, a long time ago, said that the constitutionalists expected opposition and autocracy from Russia, but they expected something better from the British officials, which they did not get. So uh, Spring Rice gives Shirol an example and uses this, this old-fashioned uh, wording here. He says, a, this is the example that he writes to him, he says, a Turkish diplomat asked me, Spring Rice wrote, quote, if England hates Muslimanism so much that even when a Muslim nation becomes a free one, that England will fight against its freedom. End of quote. Here was a deep and serious problem for Britain across her empire. As he wrote, quote, I fear our abandonment of the cause of liberty as soon as it is adopted by a Muslim nation, and our alliance with the enemy of liberty, by which he meant Russia, quote, because it is a Christian power, this all leaves this impression, end of quote. He believed that the incomprehension of the Persian constitutionalists regarding the British position would only curdle into bitterness, and that German officials are supporting the nationalist movement deepens the problem. Because coming at the issue from the other side is a German publicist named Paul Dane. 
and he gave a very interesting reading of events. Iran's constitu constitutionalist movement, he wrote, did not emulate English developments. It was parliamentary, but it is not English. Its anti-imperialist nationalism had an anti-British character. As he wrote, quote, with the help of parliamentary interests, England hopes to make moral and other conquests in Persia, <coughs> Dean wrote, end of quote. But, parliament, but he goes on to say that parliamentarism in Iran, oops, I need my glasses here, parliamentarism in Iran does not support the imperial status quo, and that the Russian-Japanese war had changed all of that. As he says, quote, in fact, it is preci precisely this parliamentarism which appears to have, in connection with the rise of Japan, instigated a movement in Persia that directs itself against Russian as well as English spe special interests, end of quote. So it's this, this kind of parliamentarism. He says, quote, Persian national feeling has also begun to awaken and expresses itself in the demand, Persia for the Persians and governed by the Persians. The German side has greeted this movement with sympathy, end of quote. So here's... Here's exactly the issue that's worrying Spring Rice, that Germany and not England is the supporter for Persian constitutionalism, and that Germany and not England is the European partner for the Iranian national movement. So from diametrically opposed political positions, Dean is a pan-German, Spring Rice is a liberal imperialist, the two men arrive at the same observations. This crossing of the lines Germany in support of Iran's national movement and Britain against was soon to come to a head. Because from the first signs of German support in Iran, this had a real effect in spurring forward the Anglo-Russian negotiations. And Germany's presence in Iran then is central to the shape and tempo of the agreement that results. So the, I'm going to go now to my first after effect, which is so if you look closely at the coming together of the Anglo-Russian Convention of 1907, you see some very interesting things. Because Iran's constitutional revolution, its political transformation is playing a very important role in the forward movement of European imperial politics. These three topics, Germany's bank project in Iran, the constitutional revolution, and the Anglo-Russian negotiations are almost always treated separately, but it makes a lot of sense to bring them together because actors at the time brought them together and saw these interconnections. Persia's revolution had been spurred forward by imperial upheaval and its, str its struggle for national sovereignty was playing out in an arena shaped by imperial conflict. These two issues being negotiated in 1907, Iranian nationality, <laughs> and imperial stability were not separate, and many saw them as entangled. More to the point, imperial officials in London and St. Petersburg used the Persian conflict to spur forward this new consensus between themselves. Arthur Nicholson, the father of Harold Nicholson, who is the British ambassador in St. Petersburg, plays an absolutely central role in all of these events. In fact, he's the designer, he's the architect of the Anglo-Russian convention, and he explicitly connects these negotiations to an anti-imperial policy in Persia from the very beginning. So what historians have called a, quote, campaign of agitation against Germany and the German bank, end of quote, this is the drumbeat, and there's a press war that goes with it. These files in, in Berlin are full of, which this, all of these clippings, this press war, the drumbeat accompanying the Anglo-Russian negotiations toward their agreement in August of 1907. Neither Germany nor the constitutionalists were to advance, and the ties between them were to be broken. The alternate future for Iran signaled by German involvement was not going to be allowed to happen. So Spring Rice's letters from Tehran describe the strategy of what's called painting the German devil on the wall as a way to bridge the differences between the British and the Russian sides. The international press war on the German bank was certainly about the German devil. In fact, uh, the British papers say that all of these German things are happening in Iran, whereas they aren't actually happening, they're on paper. They want them to happen, but they haven't happened yet. 
and but the papers say that this has happened. Look what Germany is doing. It's so they they falsify uh, the in, the information. They're painting the German devil on the wall. So this international press war is certainly about that. Now Spring Rice himself has his doubts about the Anglo-Russian negotiations, and he believes that the resulting agreement is going to be fragile. It's going to be incapable of bearing much weight. He was right on this. Given the animosities between the powers across their Asian divide and the lack of any real solutions to their differences. What they could agree on was the Persian situation. They could agree on the necessity of suppressing what both of them called Persian disorder. Spring Rice noted that here Britain would have the assistance, or at least the quiescence, of the Shah and would have the enthousi enthusiastic participation of the Russians. As he said, quote, my impression is that now Russia has successfully changed her constitution and got rid of her Duma, that she won't be very anxious to see another Duma next door and will take measures to get rid of it. As the Shah is of the same mind, they are two of a kind and they will act together, end of quote. And this proved to be a prescient observation. So at this juncture, two issues come to, the, come to the fore. One is national and one is imperial. First, this, this famous third power policy, which was said to be a staple of Iranian foreign policy in the 20th century, does not begin with Reza Shah Pahlavi in the 1920s, but begins with the constitutionalist approach to German officials in the summer of 1906. And secondly, the consequences of Germany's recognition of Iranian sovereignty cannot be overlooked, because the Russians and the British agree on very little in Iran. But starting in 1906, they make common cause on two issues, suppressing the constitutional revolution and creating a common front against Germany. So the Anglo-Russian Convention, signed on August the 31st, in 1907 in St. Petersburg, and completely over the head of the Majlis, they're not even informed until after it's done, this kills two birds with one stone. And this, the, this in Punch, they even sort of make light of this very serious point where Iran here is the cat. And the cat says, I don't remember having been consulted about this. And that's sort of played for laughs. But it's actually a very serious issue. So the convention is not driven solely. Lots of times it's said it's driven by the desire to block Germany. And it's assumed that it's, this means Germany and Europe but it actually means Germany across the Near East. It has an imperial rationale. It has a very specific Near Eastern referent in Iran. It takes direct aim at breaking up this new const constellation of Germany and Persia's constitutionalists and the possible alternate future for Iran that this relationship rep represented. So the German threat here is not wearing a, a Prussian helmet, but is in Persian garb. Two, two minutes? Let me just give a sense then of the trade report, if I can. Okay. Um, so I'm moving at my second thing is this uh, this trade report done by Kurt Jung. Just here is the map of the of the division, the partition of Iran. Because after the signing of the convention, Germany is determined to keep up its trade push into Iran. As the foreign minister von Schoen tells the Reichstag. The, the way to move forward is, as and I quote, trade, trade, and still more trade. So they're, they're continuing to push forward. So in that spirit, this young man, Kurt Jung, is sent to, sent to Iran and tasked with um, gathering data for a comprehensive economic report. So he travels in Iran in 1907 and 1908, travels all around the country, and the resulting report is five volumes. And interestingly, it's all about building infrastructure, but it's all about networks. Now with our interest in global history, it's interesting to see that volume two is about transport networks, roads and railroads, what needs to be built to facilitate Iranian uh, industrialization. And volume three is all about financial networks, a modern financial system. So Kurt Jung, um, I was gonna give, I don't have the time, but I was gonna talk about the way he talks about Yazd because the, the city of Yaz, the way that Kurt Jung talks about Yaz is, I don't think you'd find that in any other document, um, the, because he looks at it purely in, in the context of sort of what, well, I could, 
sort of what is being produced there, sort of the prosperity that undergirded the city before, why that had vanished, mainly because of the building of Russian infrastructure in the Caucasus, the Trans-Caspian Railway, which had had effects deep into Iran by routing traditional routes for, t for tea away from Yaz. So Yaz had never industrialized, it was not deindustrializing, but it was a kind of victim of what we would now call global decline all the same. So it's, it's Russian, so the building of Russian infrastructure that is having very material effects in Yazd, and that's how he talks about it, and then what the solutions are to rebuild the, the, the city's uh, prosperity. But to give a, a sense of his, of his report, he's to assess Iran's, sort of the state of the Iranian economy, and to make specific recommendations for German-driven involvement, so this is about building roads, mechanization projects, and partnering with local merchants. So in the process, he pens one of the most detailed assessments of Iran's early 20th century economy to be found anywhere. And it covers a whole host of topics. It's interesting that he emphasizes throughout the uneven development of the country and the fact that all of its pieces labor under the expansion of the Russian and British zones of influence, that that's the pressures acting on them, the pressures are very real. So he reads Iran's condition situationally in the context of Russian, British, and Ottoman connections, and he does not see its poverty in isolation, but resulting from very particular and recent modern factors. He consistently takes this bottom-up approach, valorizing these local conditions, and he, throughout, he really shows how the processes through which the abstractions of great power politics really translate down onto the ground into very material realities for merchants, farmers, and workers. So he shows how decisions taken in London and St. Petersburg and chan channeled through the Iranian court generate local effects what he, and what he describes are these landscapes of decline. So it's interesting, I mean, he's, he's writing on the weakness of the Iranian state, the fragmenting condition of the national market. Indeed, he poses the question of, their, of whether such a national market in Iran exists at all. He sees really spreading fragmentation and the political turbulence of the current period is sort of pushing all this forward. State fragility and economic fragmentation are continuing apace. They're being driven forward by the ongoing political turmoil of 1907-08 which the Anglo-Russian Convention had claimed to halt, but clearly had not. And many people, the German, a lot of the German officials think that the Anglo-Russian Convention is a part of the problem. It's not claiming to halt the polit political turmoil, but pushing it forward. So since I've run out of time in the, just to conclude, and here's uh, Mohammed Jamal Zadeh on the, on the far side there, together with Reza Tarbiat and Hassan Taki Zadeh, these are the editorial offices of Cave in Berlin. And there's a lot of information. I've, I've published a number of articles on this group. Um, the World War I sources are huge, and this, what in the German documents is called the Persian Independence Committee, is a really important part. The way they partner with the Indian Independence Committee, it gives a very interesting perspective on Iran's uh, uh, position in the war. And the way that they call themselves a constitutionalist government in exile, their, their sort of their statements of intent, kind of their manifesto when they formed themselves in 1915, all of that is, is, makes for very interesting reading. Um, to conclude, that Germany's, so I hope I've made the case to you that uh, these German documents provide incredibly Im important information on modern Iran, um, and this is another topic I've, I've published on um, quite a bit. So the when these projects that are thought out before 1914 really then begin to be realized in the 1920s, especially after 1928 and going forward, and uh, the archive is, is full of this information. Um, just some more pictures of the Kave group here, and then the man on the far side is the diplomat Rudolf Nadolny, who is the liaison uh, between the Foreign Office and German military intelligence uh, group called Section 3B, which uh, Nadolny burned all of its files at the end of the war, which is pretty. But there are copies. I mean, the Germans, like true, true to stereotype, keep lots of records. 
And if one thing gets burned, it exists in a copy somewhere else. So there's plenty of information. And then just some, this is the title of, of the book now, uh, on the 19th century side of this relationship. And then on the other side, are, I published a lot of articles on the 20th century aspects, and then this book on the 19th century story. My area of uh, work is in the uh, history, if you like, of the religious thought of scholars. In, and then my project at the moment is the sort of late 17th century uh, into the first half of the 19th century, late 18th century, first half of the 19th century. I look in particular at this period at the beginning of when Qajar Iran was forming its state institutions um, and the ulama role within that. Um, but necessarily, uh, when you're talking about the ulama, you have to um, uh, take into account the fact that they were a transnational community um, moving across borders. And as I'm hopeful I'll show you is that, that most of the religious ideas that were coming out of the ulama that were based in Iran uh, had their gestation, if you like, within the um, shrine cities of southern Iraq and particular scholars within that area. So, so the issues in terms of the study of the way in which the ulama related to the Qajar state. Um, there's a number of methodological issues which um, we still have within the field and which we're still trying to work through. First of all, there is the idea of back project projection. This is the um, accusation towards uh, certain scholars who understood the role of the ulama in the 1960s and 1970s and their role within the revolutionary movement and attempted to find the roots of that in the way in which the ulama behaved in the early 19th century and afterwards. So explaining that the ulama became the, um, a natural opposition force um, within the early Qajar period and attempting to uh, trace those ideas is a methodological sort of um, element of the, the issue that, uh, of, of how to study this period. Secondly, there's the issue which comes up about the discontinuity. So we had the Safavid period where the ulama had a particular relationship with the state. And by the end of the Safavid period, I think you can probably describe that as a pretty subservient relationship with the Safavid state. That is, that they were incorporated into elements of the Safavid state. And most of the scholars that were active and operational within the Safavid state were not what, what, the, what she history remembers as great scholars. They were quite low-ranking scholars. Not like the earlier Safavid period, where some of the scholars who were involved in the, in the administration of the Safavid state were major scholars in the way in which Shiites write their history. By the end of the Safavid period, they, were, they, were, they weren't so um, prolific. Now, what is the relationship between the, what was happening at the end of the Safavid period and following the interregnum, if you like, the beginning if you, of the Qajar period? Was, this, was there a continuity in terms of the way in which the, the, the Qajar ulama related to the state, or is there a discontinuity between it? And to what extent can we talk of a clean break in the way in which the ulama relate to the state, and a new set of relationships emerging. And then there is the inconsistency, which many people have recognised when reading what the ulama write, and then what they do. Don't try and project contemporary issues onto the past, but there is an issue with the way in which the ulama write about the legitimacy of the political uh, establishments, any political establishment, and also, but, but the history, if you like, of how we see how they operated in relation to the uh, political establishments they happen to be living under. In terms of the broad sweep of Qajar history, the, the, the areas that have been picked out by researchers so far, as the points at which uh, the ulama became particularly important for the way in which national political events emerged, they're normally highlighted as these. You've got the Persian-Russian Wars, both the first and the second, and the way in which the ulama sometimes participated, actually went to the front themselves during some of those wars, but certainly the way in which they provided fatwas describing some of those as a jihad. Um, there's the challenges to the ulama prerogative within the within the religious establishment, thinking of Shaykhism, Babism, 
Baha'ism. And what were the ulama wanting the Qajar state to do about these threats? How were they going to get the Qajar state to um, reduce the impact that they may be having on the ulama's authority? Of course, there's the famous there's tobacco boycott, and then there's the uh, involvement in the constitutional revolution. Now, uh, all of these, I would argue, can be questioned in one way or another. But my interest uh, in what I'm going to talk about today is primarily in the, what's per the perceived inconsistency, if you like, between what the ulama say about what they write, effectively, about what the, what, what the, uh, what the, how they view the state, what a, what a, sta what a political uh, organisation should be like or shouldn't be like, and then how they behave in terms of their contacts with the state. This is a, uh, 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 one element, if you like, of um, research which has been a part of um, uh, literature, secondary literature today, and which I'm working on at the moment. And then the second part is the, um, the period, if you like, of the, uh, of the development within the religious establishment between, um, uh, uh, between the, um, the, the emergence of Karbala as the major centre for study of ulama. That is, there wasn't a centre within Iran. The ulama in the late 18th century and early 19th century, if you wanted to rise the ranks, if you wanted to get any uh, credibility as a scholar, you had to go and study in Karbala. Or later, Najaf, as the centre of gravity shifts from Karbala to Najaf. No major scholar would be able to, to gain a reputation purely by staying in Iran. They had to leave and come back. And so my area of research, so we have this, this is just a, uh, uh, a little uh, short history, if you like, of what was happening in the Iraqi seminaries that were populated quite significantly by Iranian ulama. And it's that a lot of the scholars in the Iraqi semin seminaries were, who were training, and the major scholars themselves, were Iranian, of Iranian um, descent, or indeed uh, came and studied and then returned to Iran. And this is the area which I'm particularly interested in, the person of Muhammad Barqa Behbahani. Muhammad Barqa Behbahani, sometimes known as Vahide Behbahani, was the scholar credited with establishing the system known as Usulism. Usulism, I don't want to get too, I'm sure you're not that interested in the technicalities of, um, of, uh, of uh, Shi'i uh, religious legal theory, but... Usulism was the theory that um, uh, a, a mujtahid who had gained the level of ijtihad was able to make um, decrees, fatwas, and make rules which the rest of the people were religiously obliged to follow. It was a system in which that person gained a level of authority in the individual's religious life which made their rules of the same status for the ordinary believer as, as revelation. In the sense that following a mujtahid, doing taklid as it was called, is essentially following what the mujtahid says without knowing why they say it. And that's how it's defined. In the, uh, in, the, in the books of legal theory. You follow a mujtahid's rule because you're not qualified to do the investigation yourself. You entirely pass over that responsibility to the mujtahid. And your responsibility before God has been fulfilled by following the mujtahid. The mujtahid's responsibility before God, he's in a bit more of a precarious situation because he has to justify why he has done that. And he will have to on the day of resurrection to demonstrate that he tried his hardest in order to find a rule to provide for the ordinary believer. The ordinary believers, they've fulfilled their duty by following the, the rule of the mujtahid. That theory, which was established, if you like, or re-established by Muhammad Wafar al-Behbihani, is um, the one which most people trace as laying the foundations for ulama power within the Qajar period. Most secondary sources and primary sources say that this theory enabled the, uh, 
the scholarly, the, the, the religious scholars, to assume a position of authority within the community after having had a sort of a closer alliance with the uh, Safavid state, they are now proclaiming their independent authority within Qajar society. There's a ways in which you can break that down, but um, that's the uh, sort of area. I wanted really to just go through a few examples, if you like, of Iranian ulama who, tr who trained in the um, uh, Iraqi shrine cities to give you a flavor of some of the bio biographies of ulama and the way in which they were uh, uh, training, learning their skills, developing their intellectual pedigree, if you like, in the Iraqi context, and then returning to Iran and, the, and what they did. And the main thing is that there's no single, there's no single set of ways in which uh, an alim, a scholar who was trained in Iraq, related to the state. There were lots of different ways in which they did it and maintained their authority within society. These are some of the scholars. I'm not going to go through them all, actually. I'm going to pick out just a, a few of them. But these are all scholars who were Iranian or of Iranian descent, ended up training in southern Iraq, and then got involved in uh, political and social activities in Iraq. Um, they're all students. They're all students of Vahid Abefahani. Yes, they all studied with Vahid Abefahani at some point or other. Um, so I'm sort of developing this theory that Vahid Abefahani, although he never says this, seemed to have a, th seemed to have a, a program of activity in which he was training scholars in this theory of Usulism. Usul and these scholars would then move from Karbala, where he was based, back to their hometowns normally. And this would this encourage the spread, if you like, of scholarly authority through the activities of these individuals. And it's almost like these individual scholars mm -hmm. had particular responsibility for taking on the leadership in particular cities. So Mohammed Saleh Baragani was a very important scholar based in Kazwin. He studied, went to uh, southern Iraq, studied with Bahid, returned and became a major scholar in, in Kazwin. Mohammed Baki Shafti, I'll talk about in a minute, was uh, uh, the major scholar in Isfahan. Mahdi Naraki, and then his son Ahmed Naraki. Ahmed Naraki is famous, of course, as supposedly the person that first introduced the notion of Galeat al into Shi'i legal thought. And uh, many people trace the ideas of Galeat al back to Ahmed Naraki's work. He was active in Kashan and was essentially uh, operating within the Kashan area. Uh, uh, Mirza Abu al Qasim al Qumi, he wasn't from Qom originally, but he, he ended up in Qom, and that's how he gained his name and lived there for many years and was the major Mujtahid. So each town was beginning to have its own Mujtahid, who was trained by Wahid Abed Bahani and therefore promoting and expanding the areas of Usulism in Iran, <laughs> um, having been trained in Iran. If we look something just at uh, Mirza Qumi, um, uh, uh, I have a little history of his life there, in the interest of time. Um, I won't go through it all, but um, he spends time in, uh, um, in Iraq before he moves to Qom, sometime in the 1780s. He had a good relationship with Fat Ali Shah, in which there was close room patronage as well as advice, which was given. Uh, he died in 1815. He, this, is his, this is his grave in the late 19th century. Um, he worked, his works included this very important work of Kawanin al Usul, which um, is a. It takes the theory of Beth Bahani and then uh, puts it on steroids. The theory of Beth Bahani was based on the idea that knowledge is really difficult to get hold of about what God wants us to do. It's actually really hard to know what God wants you to do in terms of obedience to the Sharia. So you have to have an expert who's going to do that work for you. That expert is the Mujtahid. Okay. Now the theory was that there are some things which an ordinary believer can know without the help of a Mujtahid, and there are certain things which a Mujtahid is required for. Mr. Abu al-Qasim al-Qummi 
puts forward the idea that there's really hardly anything that an individual believer can know. <laughs> really, really very, very slim areas. The idea is that, 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 that they make this the distinction between ilm and zan. Okay? Ilm is knowledge, certain knowledge of, uh, that you are doing, you are, you are following the God's law. Zan is the idea that you might have a sort of a 70-80% chance of being right. The mujtahid, when they make a ruling, is always basing it on his zan, not ilm. The mujtahid doesn't know what the law of God is. It's in the same situation as everyone else. But he has the skills, and it is always a he in this period, he has the skills in order to examine the sources and bring out a law and then pre present it to you. His zan, when he presents it to the ordinary believer, becomes their ilm. Now for Mirza Qummi, the amount of areas that, are, that an ordinary believer can come to a certain knowledge about the law is very, very slim. They need the mujtahid for everything, which enhances the power of the mujtahid. And, uh, and his zan, um, he spent a lot of time describing how zan has the power, what he calls hojiya, has the power to produce legal rulings which individuals should follow. It's an extremely complicated work, and um, uh, I don't recommend you read it <laughs> without, um, uh, without someone who knows what it's actually trying to say. <laughs> without a much to hit in order to read it. Well, you've got to understand, when they wrote these books, they weren't, de they weren't designed for me to read and understand. They were designed for a different audience. Um, I just try and understand what they're on about. We have the Irshad Nameh. Another work of his, which is in Persian, in which he provided advice to Fat Ali Shah about what he thought Fat Ali Shah should be doing. A demonstration, if you like, that he was quite willing to give Irshad to Fat Ali Shah when he wanted it. This has been published. It was the subject of articles and examination. Lampton wrote an article. Abdul Hussein Haidi wrote an article. In English, these are secondary literature references that you can um, uh, refer to if you're interested. The Jami Shaddat which is his um, uh, fatwas collection, very interesting set of fatwas, which, um, uh, uh, with a whole, whole sections on jihad and whole sections on other areas of everyday life, in which he essentially demonstrates how uh, things become legitimate when the Mojtahid says they're legitimate, in terms of religious law. Aware of time, so um, Mirza Muhammad Akbari. So here is another, a different, completely different, if you like, set of uh, ulama um, history. This Mirza Muhammad Akbari was an Akbari, so he didn't accept Wahid al um theory of usulism. He believed that there's quite a lot that scholars can, that the individual believers can get access to in terms of knowledge of the law. They can do it by reading the Akbar, the Akbar of the Imams. That's why he's called an Akhbari. He was born in India. His family came from Khurasan some generations before. But he was born in India in, into a sort of Persianate environment within the Indian context. And uh, oh, I've, done, I've done a little map with uh, his travels. He's quite interesting. Now, my, my, um, my, uh, my drawing of the map using uh, the uh, tools which PowerPoint are made to open may not be entirely geographically precise. <laughs> okay? I did my best with the, with the mouse as I moved it across the map. I thought I'd go for a map which was roughly of the time rather than a map of uh, with, uh, with uh, 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 the contemporary map. First of all, he goes on Hajj uh, when he's 20 years old. So he's trained in India in a religious environment in Arabic and Persian. He goes on, on pilgrimage with his parents. After completing pilgrimage, he, uh, on the way back, the boat stops at Muscat, and his parents die. Both parents die within quite close uh, time with each other. So he's now an orphan. What's he going to do? Well, he decides, first of all, that he's going to take his parents to Najaf to be buried. You know, since they're there, if they'd have died in India, he might not have done this. But when you're in the region... You may as well take advantage of that um, facility. He took his parents to Najaf, and he stays in Najaf and begins to study. He studies with Vahida Bepahani, and decides that Vahida Bepahani is completely wrong. 
about his theory. So he then, uh, we're not sure whether he already thought that or whether his encounter with Vahid was so negative that it turned him against him. But he goes uh, studying in Najaf, but he becomes quite unpopular because he's promoting Akhwarism at a time when Usulism is powerful. He eventually leaves, uh, uh, he, uh, he studies in Najaf and Karbala, and eventually leaves and goes to Tehran. In Tehran, uh, he's there, staying there, and gains quite a following for his Akhbari with at least a small group of supporters. And while he's there, the, uh, the, the first Iranian-Russian war breaks out. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. He is engaging in public, de public debates in Iran with various people. Eventually, he has to leave uh, Iran because um, uh, of the Usulis in Iran being um, frustrated with him. He goes to Baghdad. He lives the rest of his life in Baghdad, where in 1817 or 1818, we're not entirely sure, a huge mob rise up against him, raid his house and kill him and one of his sons. Uh, and we still don't know where he's buried. They say he's in Kazimir. Um He wrote, before I turn on to his, um, his rather controversial police, I've done a lot of work on him, so you're going to get quite a lot of him. So I'll try and be as brief as possible. The con he wrote a huge amount of work. I mean, over 170 titles accredited to him. He was, he was by all accounts, not a very... Um, personable scholar. A lot of people didn't like him. He seems to have come across as slightly arrogant. He was trying to revive a school of thought which had been, which had died out, which was no longer popular. He went into great lengths em embarking on vitriolic attacks on the new orthodoxy <laughs> of Rasulism. Here we have a manuscript of his in which his name has been scrubbed out. Um, and he really attacks the notion of the authority of, a, of, a, of, a, of someone who is the, what they call the shirait al-ijtihad, the, the, uh, the, the ability to perform ijtihad. He also wrote a huge amount on magic, on what they, what they call the ulum um, al This was another area which is uh, over 15 works of his are on, uh, in Arabic and Persian, on letters and numerology. And he's uh, supposedly responsible for this very famous book of spells, um, the Dewa'ir uh, al And those two areas, the Akbarism and his interest in the Ulum Ghaiba, come together in the famous story of how he promised Fat Ali Shah during the first Russian, uh, Iran Russian war that he would bring him the head of Tsitsianov, Pavel Tsitsianov, in 40 days. And if he was successful in bringing, by magic, he was going to bring his head by magic, if he was successful in that, would Fat Ali Shah make Akbarism the national uh, creed of Iran? He retires for 40 days to Shah Abdul Azim. And he locks himself in a room. Many of you will know this story already. He makes wax dolls of Tiziana, um, stabs them in a voodoo-like fashion. One story says he had a picture on the wall which he made of Tiziana, and he was throwing daggers at it. So he secludes himself. And by coincidence, or if you believe in magic, by magic, Tiziana is killed in Baku when he attempts to, when he's uh, uh, trying to accept the handover of, of Baku to, uh, to the Russian forces. He's killed, and his head is brought just within the 40 days to, to, to Fat Ali Shah. Mirza Mohammed says, now it's time for Akhwarism to become the, uh, the, um, the ruling creed in Iran. The Usuli ulama, according, this is according to the story, the Usuli ulama gather together and say to Fat Ali Shah, if you let him become the person that's promoting Akbarism in Iran, that will be the end of Islam in Iran. Because he's unhinged. 
and you need people who are rational and are going to be able to run the system in a, a sensible way. So it seems like Fatah Ali Shah probably forced him to leave Iran eventually, and he goes to back where he, and he goes to Baghdad, and the rest is history. The Ursulis proclaim a fatwa against him, saying that his blood is licit, and supposedly encourage a mob to um, uh, attack his house, and he ends up being killed. He's a fascinating figure, uh, and will be a pretty large part of the book I'm writing. Um, his family will not agree with what I've just said. <laughs> I know this because I met his uh, great, 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 great grandson when I was in Karbala. And he said he never did any magic. This is all a scheme which the, uh, which the Osuli Ulama put together, a sort of a fabrication which they put together so that everyone hates it. He wasn't interested in that. They were just jealous of the fact that Fat Ali Shah loved him. Whether this is true or not, Saeed Mostadar didn't tell me um, what his evidence is for this, um, except for the fact that all of the hit accounts of the history of the period are written by Osulis. Um, anyway, uh, he wasn't impressed with my um, as account of the story. Okay. <clears throat> Um, I had one final example, which was Mohammed Baki Shafti, which I'll go through very quickly because I know we're running out of time. But Mohammed Baki Shafti was another scholar who... Oh, this is something I should say. We've got these two images, and then this is going around as a, as a picture of him. But he died in 1844. I don't see how this could be a picture of him. Those of you that know about photography in Iran, I think this is fake. But it's, you find it on a lot of Ulama websites that here's a picture of Mohammed Baki Shafti. But 80, he died in 1844. I, it's not completely impossible, but it seems highly unlikely that there's a photo of him. But anyway, and there seems to be a lot of there's a lot of photos of Olomo from the 19th century, which I think aren't photos of that. They're just a picture of a guy in a turban, <laughs> and I think that they're being used um, in order to enliven the stories which are being told about the Olomo in the 19th century. Anyway, his uh, life. He, uh, he, lived, he came from Shaft. Shaft is close to Rasht. It's a little village. Unbelievably, it's produced two major scholars, or at least it, two major scholars' come, families come from there. Because Mirza Khomri's family came from Shaft as well, which is, you know, it's a tiny little village. You would, you'd blink and you'd miss it when you were travelling through. He relocates to Karbala, studies with Vahid, uh, then he moves to Kazimir, studies there. Then he moves to Kashan, and to Qom, and then Kashan, and stays with Mirza Mahdi Naraki, and then probably with his son Ahmed, who'd returned. Uh, Ahmed, famous for his uh, promotion of Valiata Papi. And then he moves to Isfahan, becomes the leading cleric in Isfahan. The Masjid is Sayyid, which many of you were visited in Isfahan. He built that, not personally, obviously. He had people to do that for him, but he funded it. Uh, and he dies in Isfahan in 10, 1844. That's his grave. He wrote a number of books, and he is probably most famous for, amongst those of you who don't do Shi'i history, the history, Shi intellectual history, is his, ex his letter of exchange with John McNeil over the um, Muhammad Shah's attack on Herat, in which he has a letter of exchange, in which John McNeil tries to say to him, uh, you know, the Muhammad Shah is doing a bad thing by attacking Herat. You know, why don't you sort of like rein him in and try, you're, a, you're an, a, a member of the ulama, he'll listen to you, you say to him, and he says, no, Muhammad Shah is doing exactly the right thing, he's protecting the interests of the uh, Muslims by, in this campaign, uh, so... Uh, I'm not going to listen to an English guy telling me that I should tell the Shah that he's, not doing, he's doing something that might harm Islam. I'll make my own decisions about that, thank you. <laughs> apparently, he ran, um, apparently he ran Isfahan in the period pretty much like an Islamic state. These are all the stories you have about how he was willing to implement the Sharia in ways which many ulama were nervous about. 
Now, the ulama were nervous about the uh, implementing the Sharia, partly because of the theological reason, in that the, uh, the ulama have, um, uh, a, a, have delegate, ha, do not always have a delegated right in order to implement the Sharia, all areas of the Sharia, in the absence of the hidden imam. But he seems to have been quite happy with doing this, um, uh, and his Risala on Ikhamat al Hudud. This is the implementation of the Hudud penalties. Talks about the, how this is legitimized. Apparently, he's responsible for the death of between 60 and 120 people. However, the biographical dictionaries say that he felt really bad about each one. <laughs> that he, anyone he had to inflict physical pain on because of the Sharia, he felt really bad. He fainted sometimes, he would cry. It really affected him, uh, but he, it was his duty in order to, to, to carry it out. So, conclusions. Uh, so, Fat Ali Shah and Muhammad Shah clearly wished to have the ulama on their side. They courted their support at various points. But the ulama were quite willing to say no to the Shah. They, they, they weren't going to just be uh, servants of the Shah. They, they were quite willing to say no. We have very many instances of how the ulama said no to the Shah when they asked them certain things. So the ulama's support was always conditional. Different ulama had different conditions. But one of the conditions which uh, they all had was that you have to allow us to operate the areas of the Sharia that we think should be operative. Now, they varied between different ulama as to how much of the Sharia should be operative. But... Anything which prevents us from operating those areas of the Sharia that we think are valid during the occultation of the Imam means that it's not going to be, you're not going to get our support if you try and stop us doing that. There's no legitimacy, but there is a practical acceptance of support when appropriate. And you always, whenever you get, maybe this is just because I'm reading mainly ulama sources, you always get the impression that the ulama were the senior part in the partners in any discussion with the Shahs. The, the, the Shah was coming to them to ask them for advice. The Shah was coming to them to ask them if they should do this or that. The Shah was coming to the, ask, to the ulama to ask them for permission to do something. And the ulama were the people that were actually providing the, uh, the, um, the advice or the legitimation when appropriate to what the Shah was doing. And that they, were, they definitely saw themselves as in the grander scheme of things, which... Uh, is about this life and the next life. Okay. They saw themselves as the superior partners. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. I'd just like to reiterate my thanks to all the participants and also to the audience and your questions and your engagement with this. I want to remind the speakers that they will be required to send me a copy of their papers for publication which may take a little while for all of us, but is definitely a firm commitment um, to see this through. And I think it will be an extremely interesting volume, judged by uh, what we've heard so far. I'd like to reiterate my thanks to Fatima for all her help and advice in putting the programme together. to the foundation and the founders of the foundation, or the founders of the idea, among whom I know is uh, Sarah, really for having this idea, because it's a very productive way of looking at history, it seems to me, over a long period. It's not simply, let's have a conference on the Seljuks, let's have a conference on the Mongols. It's a series of conferences with a theme, which is addressing the idea of what Iran is to the British. We've heard a lot about how marvellous the British are, quite rightly. I'm going to get another of these pin bills with a <laughs> British flag, because I'm a nationalist as well, you know. I mean, the British are allowed to be awful, just like everybody else. Uh, so, um, I think we've had a go at everybody, really. Uh, and um, we haven't had enough of a go at the Iranians, because if you read what the British think about the Iranians, it's pretty frightful. Uh, but anyway, um, I think we've covered a lot of ground, actually, quite rightly, because I said at the beginning, of course, this is a, an important period. It's a long period, and one that uh, generates so many aspects of opening up the country, as we said, to the foreigners and the, the, uh, the Iranians themselves to become aware of the wider world outside. So um, thank you, Fatima, for persisting with this um, really excellent 
series, and um, I think this might be one of the last, certainly as far as my involvement is concerned, but the, uh, the um, jury's out on that. Uh, so there we are, and also to the whole foundation of course, as I'm supporting it. So thank you very much.